this is another one of my videos on Alistair Parker's uh, short introduction to the Second World War, this one dealing with strategic bombing. It comes from his chapter 10, which is quite a long chapter, so I've subdivided it into various sections. So during World War II, British and American leaders devoted much material and skill to strategic bombing with the aim of destroying an enemy's economy and will to fight. In the summer of 1941, at their Atlantic meeting, British military staff told the Americans that they hoped to defeat the uh, Germans uh, by bombing alone. Yet already the German blitz on Britain, one of the three great strategic air assaults in the war, had failed. And British experts had expected that it would cause 600,000 deaths and 1,200,000 serious injuries. And respectable psychiatrists thought that there might be 3 to 4 million cases of neurotic disorder and panic hysteria as a result of the German bombing. The British authorities had feared that this would lead to complete social collapse and then an irreversible demand for peace. But after two months of bombing, none of these consequences had occurred. The British counterattacks on Germany had also failed. A British inquiry concluded that in night raids on the Ruhr in June and July 1941, only six out of every 100 aircraft had got to within five miles of their targets. Losses of bomber crews ex often exceeded the number of Germans killed. Given this data, it may seem surprising that subsequent British and American bombing campaigns even took place. But the Royal Air Force originally came into existence as a separate armed force purely to bomb. Long before the war, the RAF had successfully asked for a bombing force to be ready by 1942. In 1941, it would have been a waste of resources that had already been assembled to abandon the project of strategic bombing. Moreover, the British needed some means of striking at Germany so as to give a prospect for eventual victory when Britain was fighting alone. Later, it was a means of giving active support to the Soviets. The Navy could only win the war by blockade, a hope weakened first by Soviet help to Germany and later by the German conquest of Soviet resources. The army surely could never defeat the German army, only the RAF therefore remained. A key figure here was Frederick Lidman, the first Viscount Cherwell. Cherwell, a friend at Churchill's court, set in train an inquiry which showed that Bomber Command was not able to hit its target satisfactorily, but then concluded that this only showed the need for improved navigation rather than questioning strategic bombing as a strategy in itself. The pro-bombing faction in Britain was very self-confident. They argued that the German bombing of Britain showed what could be done, only with a much larger force. The Luftwaffe had failed to drive the British public into historical panic, but they destroyed many buildings. Most people were less vulnerable than was expected. Houses were much more. It was calculated that the German raid on Coventry, for example, had dropped one tonne of bombs every 800 of the city's inhabitants, which had, according to the British Air Staff, led to a 37% reduction in the normal index of activity the following morning, and had taken over a month to recover. Therefore, if that weight of bombs could be dropped five or six times within six months, towns and their economic activity could be destroyed. If the RAF Bomber Command had a first-line force of 4,000 heavy bombers, that is, with fully trained crews and reserves of men for replacement, rest and repair, then it could wipe out 43 selected German towns and break Germany in six months. But in October 1941, 
Prime Minister Churchill refused to place unbounded confidence in this as a means of attack. For him, it was an un unwise man who thought that there was any certain means of winning the war. There were also serious practical problems to meeting the RAF's goals. The RAF wanted 22,000 bombers by July 1943, but by then British factories had only produced 11,500, of which less than half were the heavy bombers they wanted. Other parts of the RAF competed with bomber command for some of those aircraft, and when the Americans entered the war, they were not willing to place their bombers at the disposal of the RAF. By February 1943, Bomber Command had only just over 1,000 bombers in its first line strength, and even by March 1945, it had less than 2,000, although by then over half were the highly efficient Lancaster bombers. Bomber Command never achieved their 1941 goal, and it was only after June 1944, when together with the Americans, they regularly dropped the hope for weight of bombs on a regular basis. This is uh, one of the Lancaster, surviving Lancaster bombers, by the way. In March 1942, based on the actual number of aircraft he expected to be available, but assuming a higher level of accuracy than the air staff had done, Chilwell argued that within about 15 months, the great majority of the inhabitants of 58 German towns would have lost their homes. He believed that investigation seemed to show that having one's house demolished was even more damaging to people's morale than having their friends or relatives killed. In Hull in England, for example, the destruction of one-tenth of the houses had led the inhabitants to show signs of strain. So the destruction of 58 German towns would break the spirit of the German people, he supposed. In a directive of the 14th of February 1942, the Air Ministry told the head of Bomber Command that the primary objective of their operations should now focus on the morale of the enemy's civilians, particularly as the industrial workers. The targets should be the built-up areas of towns that had industrial importance. Although before the war, the RAF expected to make precise daylight raids on precise military targets, including dockyards and aircraft factories. Like the Germans, they'd learned that unescorted bombers flying in daylight suffered excessive losses, and that at night time, targets smaller than large towns were hard to find, let alone hit. The British were also impressed by the German use of incendiary bombs noting that fire did more damage than high explosive, so that their tactics for night raids were to begin with fire raising, which illumined targets for a concentrated attack with high explosives, which would disrupt the attempts by the victims to check the fires. This would not stop industry directly. Machinery was far more difficult to destroy than buildings, but it would disorganize towns and make their inhabitants unable or unwilling to do productive work accurately German propaganda dubbed this terror bombing. Whilst the Bombing Code of Conduct issued by the Air Ministry in October 1942 specified that in their operations over German occupied territories, RAF attacks must be confined to military targets, crews taking care to avoid civilian loss of life near the target. In cases of doubt, even attack should not be made. By contrast, these rules did not apply to German, Italian, or later Japanese territory. In Germany, area bombing became the norm, whilst daylight bombing and attempts to hit precise targets continued. There were relatively few prior to June 1944. From 1942 to 1945, RAF Bomber Command destroyed about half of the built-up areas in 79 German towns. So I'll continue uh, with this chapter in the next video, 
Uh, many thanks to you for listening, and particular thanks to my patrons for their kind support and encouragement, without which I wouldn't be able to make uh, these videos. You're very welcome to support my channel. Please do like, comment, and share on the videos. Subscribe if you want to be notified of future videos. I'll give Patreon and PayPal links below if you want to provide practical support. Next week, we'll continue with strategic bombing. Have a good day.